Hi, I'm Tatiana Bazzichelli, the Artistic Director of the Disruption Lab, and I'm really glad now to introduce uh, wonderful people that are sitting close to me. Uh, from the left, uh, we have uh, um, Andrea Salcedo, Hannah Jane Parkinson, and Vlad Yoler. And uh, so today we have been discussing a lot about uh, uh, the induced ignorance and also conspiracy theories. Uh, and uh, in a sense, now we are entering into another realm of discussion that is related to uh, the induced ignorance in the political and technological framework. And uh, the idea would be then also to go into really concrete uh, uh, example and in concrete practices. And in a sense, I think uh, uh, perhaps we will also do something that's uh, is not really uh, you know, bringing conspiracy theory, the theories, but trying to question authority. I think <laughs> many of our projects actually do that. And also, in, in that sense, I also feel pretty close to certain uh, critical way of thinking, even if, of course, I'm, I'm not saying that we are doing conspiracy theory, but I think still that is really important also to encourage uh, a sense of uh, questioning also power mechanism. So I found really interesting that in the panel before there was really this question mark about where a conspiracy theory is finishing and where we are entering instead into the field work of not trusting the authorities. And I think in a sense we could also speak about technological authorities here. And uh, um, and also the way that technology could, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, encourage a form of uh, non-knowledge. Um, so I am happy to say that, uh, in a sense, with this panel, we managed to create also an interesting network because uh, uh, the people that are close to me have uh, uh, similar but also really diverse backgrounds. So I'm also curious to see what will be the result of this panel <laughs> and see if actually we'll be able to have uh, a, you know, a kind of a common discussion, but I'm pretty sure will be the case, but I think probably there will be also, a, you know, like a bit of jumping uh, uh, of uh, topics uh, and the perspective also reconnected with what we have been spoken already in the past two days. So I would say just to introduce briefly, um, I could say that this uh, panel was conceptualized uh, um, into various uh, question marks and also various conceptual challenges. That could be, for example, how it's possible to understand the dominant technologies of today and also which strategies of manipulation are hidden behind the use of social media. And also, at the same time, we will discuss uh, um, the post-truth political campaigns and also what does it mean to speak about post-truth today also uh, relating then to the use of media and social media. Um, so I would say we start uh, first with uh, Andrea Salcedo. I want to introduce a bit more in depth uh, what you do and uh, what will be the first uh, question of this panel. Um, because Andrea Salcedo is part of the Hippolyta group. Probably you already heard about them. They have been really working uh, consistently uh, since a really long time about the discourse of technology of domination and also their social effects. Uh, for example, they uh, wrote uh, uh, the book in the Facebook Aquarium in 2012, The Dark Side of Google in 2007, and Open is Not Free in 2005. And uh, I think uh, you have really an interesting modality of working because you really work as a collective, so your books uh, are the result of uh, collecting sharing and uh, is interesting theoretically because uh, these books speak about uh, technology but at the same time also about a form of domination and the, in which way also the power uh, structure are informing uh, media and technologies. And uh, the last uh, book that they wrote that uh, I think at the moment is still only in Italian Yes, so hopefully it will be translated soon, who knows. Uh, it's called uh, Anime Electrice, Riti and Miti Social, that I, I would translate in English, uh, Electric Souls, Social Rituals and Meats. 
uh, was just published this year, um, and is about also uh, the concrete way social media work by quantifying our lives. And I want to quote uh, a piece that I also translated <laughs> into English, so I did a bit by myself there. Um, that's uh, is something that you find on the synopsis of the book, and uh, I think can uh, reflect really well also the first. Uh, topic we are going to analyze. Um, we are electrical souls permanently in ecstasy, practicing the discipline of emotional pornography in the media spotlights. Without realizing, we are at the mercy of a doping and manipulative power. And I think this is really an interesting way to start this panel, because in a sense, we could address the discourse of how power could be manipulative, and also what does it mean to connect uh, the discourse of emotional pornography with uh, the idea of uh, power and the use of technology. So we start with Andrea Salcedo that will tell us more about this and also I wanted to ask you something in the public, please don't uh, take photos uh, of Andrea because he really doesn't want. <laughs> and uh, so we have actually a photographer and a video team you can see, but we will work in post-production so he will not appear. So please, I ask you to respect that and don't take any photos of him. Thank you. So I leave the word to you now. Oh, perfect. Okay, uh, thank you for uh, calling us here. I'm very happy to be there. Uh, we are a collective, so um, basically um, this is what you said. I just add that um, this is our website and um, I will add that we made the copyleft book, which is not so new but uh, in fact it's strange in the sense that uh, in, uh, usually you don't do copyleft in a mainstream uh, uh, production. We, we are mainstream in the sense that we publish with major publishers, uh, not in English in fact, in English we are published by ENC in Amsterdam, but in Italian and in French uh, we are published by major publisher and I think that it is important to understand that we can make culture with money also, but copyleft. What does it mean? It means that this is not a crime to disseminate and copy. I mean, copyright is really old stuff. We have to stop with that. Okay. Um, second thing I, I have to add to Tatiana's um, presentation. Yes, our best sellers. Okay, forthcoming books, so if you have suggestion, please, uh, you're welcome. About hacker pedagog pedagogic, I'm sorry, I'm not, I, I do not speak well in English, I, I'm not at ease in English, I prefer French or Spanish or Italian, but okay, I'm not good in Deutsch, so English. And um, okay, pedagogy of hacking, it means that we as hackers, we have something to pass to other people. We can manage, we are in love with machines. We can manage something good, but we have to, to do it with other people. And uh, another project is uh, about uh, anarcho-capitalism, uh, that is right libertarianism explained. We, 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 ma we managed to do uh, something like this in 2010 with the Facebook book, but we need to, to go in depth. And a, a, a lexicon about technologies of domination. So if you have a, a word that you really want to be analyzed in a lexicon, please drop us an email. Email is here, info at hippolyta.net. Okay. Okay. Um, we are heteronym, okay, not important. We are, we, we are, we doing, we are doing uh, since 10 years uh, workshop and trainings for uh, children, academics, curious people, because we think that uh, writing is a direct action, so we need to do something also, not only write. Okay, so gamification. Who knows what is gamification? Perfect, perfectly, okay. Do you want a, a brief... Uh, 
video to explain it. Uh, yes? Okay. The video is better that I can explain. So I hope we, I have. Uh, is uh, from YouTube. In the early 1930s, a man named Burhus Frederick Skinner began to study psychology in a radical new way. See, before him, we only knew how to condition reactions. We could condition a person to be terrified of pumpkins or hungry at the sight of office supplies. But Skinner theorized that you could go one further. He theorized that you could condition volition, that you could change the way that people made choices. So why are we talking about it? Because a vast number of today's games are built upon Skinner's discoveries, and it's starting to become a bad habit. But before I get ahead of myself, let's take a closer look at what Skinner did. Skinner created a machine, a simple box with a button in it, that he would put pigeons in. When the pigeons pecked at the button, the machine would give them food. He then hooked the box up to a recording device so he could tell how often the pigeons pecked the button. Seems simple enough, so why was this so groundbreaking? Because pecking the button is active. This wasn't just an automatic reaction to stimuli, it involved making a decision. So if Skinner could show that he could consistently change how often the pigeons pecked the button, he could show that he could condition them to make a specific choice. This is called operant conditioning. Now, there were two amazing parts to his findings. One, operant conditioning works on humans. Two, simply rewarding someone every time they do an action isn't the best way to keep them continually doing that action. Rather, if you provide a reward to a person after they perform the action a random number of times, or only give a reward once every so many minutes, these methods are far more effective at conditioning someone to repeat an action. Skinner often talked about operant conditioning in terms of gambling. Most gambling games are not rigged in the gambler's favor, and oddly enough, most gamblers are well aware of this. And yet, they continue to gamble rather than perform an equally strenuous job that has a regular payout with a higher net profit. Consider which activity people will tell you is more fun. Spending eight hours in a casino playing the slots and ending up with a hundred bucks? Or pushing a button in a factory for eight hours and getting a paycheck for a hundred bucks at the end? This is all compounded by another discovery of Skinner's research. He demonstrated that primary conditioners, or rewards that are fundamental biological needs, you know, food, water, sex, etc., have a diminishing effect once a person reaches satiation, or the biological limit of their needs. But then there are secondary reinforcers, things outside the biological realm, like money or social approbation. These things generally don't hit a satiation point. You can probably see where we're going with this. Many of you have played Farmville or World of Warcraft well past the point where it was fun. Why? because those games are very clearly built around reward schedules. The entire design of both of those games is to condition you to continue to repeat an action that has long since lost its novelty, that has long since become tedious. Actually, before we continue, quick disclaimer. Being conditioned to do an action and being addicted to something are very different. We're not gonna go into the addiction thing today, but I just wanted to acknowledge the difference. All we're gonna talk about today is how games can condition us. Okay, disclaimer over. So why is it a problem if games do this? For now, let's ignore the questionable morality of using Skinner's theories to create games. The problem is that it's a lazy and cheap way to get someone... Okay, so... Basically, gamification is about the use of game structure, such as rewards and uh, points, pointsification, leaderboards, and stuff like that, to engage people doing stuff uh, that are not games like contribution to websites, like uh, click, click, click to something. And gamification is everywhere. Gamification rely on open conditioning, but not only. But the main structure is the Skinner box game. So when you see points, numbers, figures in a web interface, you are pretty sure that you, are, you have operant conditioning and gamification installed. And it is installed in you. Why? Because your brain works like that. I'm sorry to say that, but we like do stupid things. Why? Because the dopamine system works, we do not know maybe, but it works like that, and you, you are satisfied by the fact that someone tells you, terrific, fantastic, you're awesome. This is Candy Crush, you know. But it works. It really works. It works on every human, because humans want to be, you know, you are good. And some points, maybe little rewards, works, really works. Okay. 
So gamification is uh, uh, a commodification. It means that it, we, we, we know, it, I mean, when you don't see the price, you are the commodity. We said it, this 10 years ago in our books about Google and many people said it well bef before us, but it obvious. If there is no price and is for free, free like free beer, not free like freedom, it means that you are the commodity. So this is just, and maybe I will repeat that, but we are not workers, please. We are not workers in this game. We are just the primary matters, the, I mean, the, the coal, the, the substratum, the, you know, the biological reservoir. Really, we are, the, the brain works like a, a treadmill, you, you, you keep doing an action, okay? This is all about gamification, we, we can go really far, uh, but just, I, I take a, really, okay, this is gamified, a gamified interface, uh, we, are, we, we do not have a lot of uh, uh, figures, but we have this, the, the sky, you see the sky, the blue stuff, this is the sky, and here, is green. Why? You can go. But look at that. When you are inside, you have a little, a little red stuff, which are notifications with figures, with numbers. This quantify you. How much you worth? What is your value? The, the figures are. And even if you don't want to, 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 to trust me, but trust you and uh, try erase the figures and put some uh, value like uh, enough or too much or not enough and you, you, you will see, you find yourself like uh, how much, but really how much? I mean, the number is the point of gamification to transform yourself in a machine keeping doing something, okay? Okay, um, so, we are not in, in a game when we are tied with the machine we like, with machine uh, we are connecting uh, with other people uh, through those mach these machines. We are doing some, something else. For example, we are socializing, but socializing pervert itself in self-advertising because you post stuff that people likes, that people rates. You are rated about your performance, okay? And uh, a lot of other things you, you do, we do, because we are, we are in a cycle and the cycle satisfies us. We do not really choose uh, in the sense that uh, there is a path and the path is uh, well defined before our choice. If you have two choices and the choice is uh, you can lose or you can win. Do you want to lose or to win? Do you want to have the date or not? To go to the, the, the interesting thing, uh, you have to click, uh, click here and you win. You click. That's why we are, we are not choosing, really not choosing, okay? And uh, I'm trying to go to the porn, porn stuff, which is the difficult part, of course. Um, I would say that in Italian it's it easier, so please read the book. No, but okay, I, I'm trying. Um, gamification, of course, is an exploitation of your brain, of our brain. We have to, to focus on the fact that when, when we use these kind of technologies, in fact, we are using another body that is not our physical disconnected body, but is a physical connected body in places we do not control. Data centers from corporations, etc. Corporation, body corporation, okay? They incorporate us. Literally, we are 
corpse in their bodies. They extract knowledge, they extract our habits, they extract our behaviors to serialize, to uh, commodify every single moment. And we agree, why? Because it's funny, it's good. Someone else choice instead of you. Where the porn, the, the porn stuff comes? Okay, let's try this. Um, machines and human beings. What is the difference? In one word, two words maybe. The difference, machines, human beings. Ideas? Consciousness and unconsciousness, emotion. emotion. Flesh and I, I don't understand. Flesh and flesh. Ah, flesh. Okay. Now machines have flesh, uh, digital, but whatever. To us, the difference is uh, the machines always tell the truth, always, because they respond, they react to your commands. This is the basic hacker experience. You have the right commands on the, on, the, on the command line and machines tell you the truth. If you can, if you have the power to pose the right question, to put the, right, the question in the right terms, which is always a command with machines, machines tell you the truth. And the point is with gamification that we act like machines because we tell the truth all the time. We tell, uh, what? Okay. Uh, we tell the, 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 the truth all the time and uh, this is a problem to us. Social experience is not made by truth. And uh, it's over? Can I make a comment? Oh, yeah. A question comment. But machine will not tell the truth, machine will tell what she's programmed to tell, kind of, you know? Same thing. thing. No. You are programmed, you, you as gamified ones, you tell what you are programmed to, to, to answer. But, yeah, but okay, we, we are whatever. going, we, we, we really <laughs> go really, f really far. I, I understand the question, you are right in a sense, uh, I think. But, uh, well, well, for my discourse, I need to go on this part. But we, we, we will, I hope we will talk about that. <laughs> no, but, no, I, I cannot go to the, to the porn stuff, please. It's difficult. Please, help me. <laughs> and it's in English, what? Okay. <laughs> so, the porn idea of emotional pornography is not a metaphor. I mean, it's like real pornography. What is pornography? It is the art of writing and representing prostitution in Greek. Okay? So, the most of pornography we know is uh, patriarchal drive driven and sexist and uh, trying to expose the inner secrets of the body. Okay? And uh, uh, is a stimulation of an autom automated response, automated reaction. Uh, there is no place for narrative, you just have organs making stuff with details uh, really inside, you know, no narratives. And details in full light. This is exactly the same thing that happens in social networked commodified stuff when you expose your emotion or you expose the emotion of other people. You use the light to enlighten something that has not to be enlightened. Make an example, for example, death. It's good to, to talk about death. It's, it's necessary to talk about death. Civilization starts with the graves and, you know, this is civilization, it's about death. But if you take a photo of a little child on the shore and put on your Facebook web page and you obtain what? Likes. This is emotional pornography. Emotional pornography is about uh, a company or an ONG 
coming to you and saying, hey, but you know, there are little children in Africa. They need you. They have big, big uh, pancha, uh, bell, and the flies, and show you the flies on the eyes of the, the children. Why? For an automated response, you feel guilty automatically, and you open up and give your money. This is automated response, no narratives. Only organs, only commodified organs, and the light in, in, in full light. No ambiguity, the message is clear, and repeat the message, repeat the message, repeat the message, and you answer to the message, you react to the message. Automation, gamified automation of your emotional response. And uh, so, of course, uh, we, we do not, this is not the first time, it's not uh, uh, in, um, the, 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 the fault of uh, social networking stuff. I mean, the TV shows and stuff like that, you know that you don't need to be intelligent or, uh, or beautiful or whatever. You just need to be there and cry and shout and, you know, big brothers show like that. You, you humiliate other people, you are humiliated by them. You show your guts, your emotion, and you are applause because you are true. The point is that the body and the inner secrets of the body do not have any epistemologically speaking, truth value. Quantified self, which is about your heartbeat, your uh, transpiration point, your whatever you want to monitor about your body, do not tell nothing about you. Just tell you in figures, in number, and trying to have this kind of conspiracy about, uh, so, if you have an heartbeat that is the average of the average of the I don't know what, we can compare that and say you are lying or stuff like that. I mean, it's, this is nothing about your character, about your person, about your inner beliefs. So, uh, the, this is, is the, the, the point about uh, why we are getting into this emotional pornography. We are paid for that. How? Because we have uh, chemical rewards. If you, t if you ask to a, chi to a child, what kind of uh, picture you, you put on your Instagram page, uh, a one with your bruises, on your, beer, on your uh, bike, you fall off your bike, you have bruises, and you post it. Why? Because this is, you know, secrets. This is truth. Your body tells the truth. You do not post uh, stuff like uh, uh, different from the inner secrets of you. And you are looking what? You are looking for inner secrets and dirty secrets of other people all the time. You're looking for that. You, you really love this. We really love this. And this is the point, because we, as hackers, we need to be clever, clear about that. We have the power to enter the life of people. We can do that. We have to shift from the I can do and I do and to I can do that, but I do not want to do that. And this is a difficult task because, you know, hackers are not a good people by design. So I just suggest to take into account the point that uh, we need to uh, have, you know, like uh, aliens with such, this kind of people. You tell me when, uh, two minutes? Good. So, basically, yes, this is, is a, this is a, as you can see, a uh, biopolitical uh, question. We are in the Foucauldian uh, perspective of what is really biopolitics. This is biopolitics. You act in the public scene because of uh, a 
control that is self control of your body which is also a connected body which is also a digital body etc this is the whole point we try to learn to teach uh, to children and to learn from them how you can manage the uh, your body in the corporated body maybe you can't i think you can't but okay nevertheless we we try to do to 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 be self aware conscious about the fact that we are in other, in the place of the other people after the login password stuff you know you are not at your in your place so be careful and um, yes this is uh, some suggestion we can start thinking about uh, how much we ask for obscenity because we we want to know to know the details the dirty details also of governments you know pasolini said uh, we do not like pasolini but he said one, once upon a time uh, i know who's, who who uh, did the the, uh, the command uh, who had the command of uh, stragi in italy in the 70s i know but uh, i no i i do not need the proofs we know we know that government is corrupted. Stop by searching about uh, real stuff. I mean, this is espionage. This is not uh, spend your time building our own reality, self-managed. So stop thinking about stuff we do not want to do involved into and start, you know, make your stuff and share it with others and build your your convivial technology with others and that's it okay start from you and we, we just try yeah okay so if you have suggestion but I, I think trying to disconnect also a little bit uh, you can find yourself with a lot of time to do interesting interesting stuff so okay this is the okay nothing more thank you Thanks a lot, Andrea. So now we go on with our uh, rounds. And also I wanted to tell you a bit how my mind works when I try to build up these panels. <laughs> because, uh, I mean, reading the book of Hippolyta, then I thought, oh, this is really interesting. And then I was really looking for a speaker that uh, could speak uh, in a good way about uh, self-branding. And then uh, the idea of pornification really made me uh, think uh, about uh, the direction also politics is taking nowadays, especially if we speak about uh, self-branding and also post-truth facts. Uh, and of course, uh, the first image that came in my mind was uh, Trump. So then I was uh, looking around in the internet to find somebody that had a good analysis of that. And I found uh, Hannah Jane Parkinson. Uh, she is working um, at The Guardian, is a digital culture journalist and writer, and she covers a lot of topics there, like uh, pop culture, music, uh, tech, football, politics, and mental health. And I found this article that she wrote in 2015 that was called Can Donald Trump's social media genius take him all the way to the White House? And I found it uh, really interesting also because it was one of the few articles actually that is really analyzing uh, how social media, how, how Trump is working with social media and also establish a sort of uh, power and operate power through them and also what is the response of the broader social media community. So then I entered in contact with her, we started to have a dialogue, and she also started to tell me about so, the problematic post by the votes leave uh, uh, campaign by Boris Johnson and all the discourse of the post-truths. So I found it really interesting also to combine these things, so now I leave the word to her, <laughs> and we enter into this other realm of, uh, I would say, uh, self-branding and emotional pornification because I think it's also a lot what Trump is doing but you will tell us more. Okay, is this... Yeah? Yeah? Okay, brilliant. Hello. Um, also, thank you very much uh, for being here. This is really interesting and um, 
I'm really glad to be invited. Um, Andrea mentioned some things as well that I might pick up on, although looking at everyone's presentations, mine is definitely not up to that standard. Um, I apologize for this picture. Um, I don't really know the slide, so just, just work with me on this. Um, but I'm going to start uh, with, with Trump and his uh, social media strategy and how he's, his team around him as well have implemented that and how it's had an impact on this uh, US election cycle. And then, as Tatiana says, I'll talk a bit about what's happening in UK politics, which, if you follow it, um, is... I don't know what the German is for shitstorm, but it's, it's pretty much that. Um, so I'll talk about how Trump's uh, social media campaign has been doing well, but I thought uh, I'd just show you this, this brilliant bit where it didn't go so well. This is a video that he did, for, which was picked up by some news channels, but it was part of his mini um, Vine strategy. I don't know if anyone's seen this, but I enjoyed this. <laughs> So that's just a really short clip, but I loved this because it backfired, because that went all around um, as much as the things that he, he hopes to do. Um, so I'm just going to start by saying, if we, can, if we can do this, this is the article that uh, Tatiana talked about. The, the, I've just done a, a, a tiny URL there, so if you want to have a little read about it, um, then you can read the whole thing here. Um, and one of the key points in this was Trump, who is obviously a man worth millions and millions of dollars, um, although we're not sure how much because he doesn't release any of his tax returns. So he could secretly be worth like five euro. Um, we, don't, we don't know. Um, he had spent um, until recently um, no money uh, whatsoever or very minimal amount of money on um, US TV advertising in his campaign, especially when he was aiming uh, for the Republican nomination which is staggering because he sits on so much money and he just was not spending any on traditional media advertising because his digital campaign was, that was what he was really focusing on. And of course, because he was uh, going straight to um, his, his kind of target audience via kind of Vine account, Instagram, Twitter, uh, YouTube, Snapchat, all of these things, he wasn't courting the general traditional mainstream media as it's, as it's MSM, as it's now called, and, and denigrate it. But of course, traditional media outlets were picking up on this. So he didn't have to spend any money because him and his team could create a short 15 second clip um, or a vine. And then of course, the TV networks would, would pick that up and run it. So he was essentially gaining free, free advertising. Um, and the other campaigns, which were not um, adept at this, were spending a lot of money. So these are some of the, the kind of you know, networks that he would be on. We'll talk about comment sections in a minute because that's um, quite interesting. But another thing is, um, I don't know, did anyone watch the televised, the, the first, um, actually this is about the convention, um, but I don't know if anyone watched the first TV debate between Clinton and Trump, uh, which was interesting. And I actually watched that late at, late at night. So I had my, um, if anyone's got an Apple phone, the, the night shift mode on, so it goes yellow, and to see Trump with a yellow filter on top, he, his, his skin is, you know, I didn't think it could get more orange. Um, but this is an, uh, another interesting example of the money that he spends uh, digitally rather than uh, traditional media outlets. So they actually bought, um, on the last day of the um, Republican convention, the get your Trump gear hashtag. So it was a promoted hashtag, but it was, so it was, it was trending, um, but everyone, you know, people who maybe don't notice that it's promoted, but they, that campaign bought that, and then maybe bought a load of his merchandise. I don't know. Um, these are figures that they filed in June, um, which was so. They, these are things that they do actually declare, which again isn't isn't really the top of his list. Um, so the Trump campaign, uh, campaign spent 1.6 million on digital consulting and online advertising, and the Clinton camp. Uh, in comparison, it spent just over $350,000, which is obviously a huge, uh, a huge difference. That You have to take that into context that the different campaigns kind of categorize how their spending is. Um, so kind of the, the gap is, is definitely there, but you have to kind of be careful of how they would categorize their spending money. But in terms of their overall budget, you can see how, you know, comparatively how much of their overall spend 
the Clinton camp is spending on digital and the, and the Trump camp is. Although I'll also speak about how they don't actually need to spend that much money on it because Trump, a lot of his supporters and campaigners are basically giving him free, um, f you know, free publicity. Uh, these were figures um, in August, which uh, NBC News, the ad, the analytics division, um, if you can see, this is the uh, TV advertising that was spent. Um, I would estimate that the Trump campaign being zero isn't quite zero. Um, I think they've probably rounded it, that down. But it was, it was not until August that they, the Trump campaign spent its first kind of blowout on traditional TV advertising in swing states for, for many, many months. They just weren't, they just weren't kind of paying for traditional TV advertising. Um, and also just weren't even appearing on media outlets or engaging the mainstream media at all because why, um, oh, this will touch on some of what you said about social media, why would you go on, or, you know, speak at something like this or go on um, a kind of normal TV show where your words could be twisted or you could be asked questions that you don't want to answer when you could put out your own Vine, your own 15 second video clip, completely in control of it. Um, you don't have, you know, a pushback on what you're saying. So he could very easily control this narrative. You know, he can, and again, we'll talk about his, his lies and his uh, post-truth politics. But if, if I sit here and say, tell you all a massive lie, then one of you could challenge me on it. It goes out to TV, you know, it's, he, he kind of lacks the control, um, which is why he kind of eschews the usual, the usual channels. Um, and he puts out his messages in these very short clips. Um, and then of course it's circulated and then it goes onto the TV and they don't really have him like messing up or stumbling because he's, he's put out these tiny digital bites. Um, and the other thing is that when he is challenged, he doesn't seem to care however many lies he tells. Um, these are just a couple of stats on his uh, engagement. I actually looked at the, the article as well, which as Tatiana said I wrote in December. Um, and basically these, have, um, these figures have doubled since then. So when I wrote that article, um, he had a kind of like half of these figures basically. I think he had around 5.5 um, million Twitter followers and then they've doubled. But we will talk about whether all these Twitter followers are real. Um, Surely, um, just let me know how I am on like time and stuff. Um, uh, this was some figures after the first uh, Republican um, televised debate, which was on Monday, um, which was the one I was talking about. Um, these are some stats on uh, Trump dominating 62% uh, of uh, Twitter mentions and conversation online and on Facebook, it was around 79%. Uh, now this doesn't always translate into whether that, you know, there's no supporters because a lot of the time there are people saying, you know, Trump is an idiot, et cetera, et cetera. So you have to be careful on, on you know, what people are saying and whether that kind of translates into his supporters or not. Um, but even people who are kind of anti-Trump, just the fact that he's kind of dominating the conversation is something that actually that he's quite proud of and they're very happy to do. Um, and his actual kind of focus, uh, Dan Pfeiffer, who, Ran Obama's um, first election campaign in 2008 has spoken about how kind of good he thinks Trump is at recognizing how important kind of social media strategy is. I will caveat this and, and probably mention later that I'm very much um, of the opinion that none of this really matters unless people go out and vote. I think my generation in particular often think that if they kind of you know like a post, that's it. They've they've voted. Um, which annoys me and doesn't translate. And um, I will talk about the EU referendum later, although it, I might cry. Um, this amuses me just, this isn't to do with Trump's campaign, it's his hotel business and his general massive conglomerate, but I do find this amusing um, because this is uh, his whole thing, which is like Trump connects, we can connect. And then this is about three hours ago, um, their experience, a high volume of traffic. Uh, so please check back soon and this is the, his business's website about um, trying to connect people, which is quite funny when you go on it and there's no access. Um, this is a short example of the things that his campaign team have um, masterminded. This is an Instagram, uh, short Instagram clip, which is 15 seconds. And this is a lot of what he's pushing out. And then of course, this will be picked up by the TV outlets and shown, and it's him just being an idiot again, really. 
um, but is then kind of, you know, pushed out onto all the media. Um, he also described himself as, as in kind of characteristic understatement. And, um, you know, modesty, I think, that he was like the best person who'd ever been on Twitter and called himself the Ernest Hemingway of uh, Twitter. So he doesn't really lack self-confidence, uh, but this is- Well, the world is in turmoil and falling apart in so many different ways, especially with ISIS. Our president is worried about global warming. What a ridiculous situation. He's, it, he's such an idiot. Um, so <laughs> I just, it's not funny because it's really worrying, um, but this is the kind of thing that he pushes out and it will get traction. And the th thing about being in this post-truth politics is there's a, a website called Politifax. I don't know if anyone knows it. It won the Pulitzer Prize. And it is about kind of, um, it checks the things that politicians say as to whether they're uh, based in fact. And I will need to check this, <laughs> check this figure at the end. Uh, but I don't know if anyone can guess, maybe they, they run his comments, and if anyone can guess a percentage of how much of what he talks about is false or didn't check out. Got any guesses? No? It's circa kind of 79%, I think, so about what 80% of what he says is just complete bullshit. Excuse me, I don't know if I'm allowed to work, just cut that bit out. Um, so here's where I check that at the end, and it's like 30% and I am Trump. Um, but if anyone, if you go to politifact.com, that will, it's a really good thing to check um, against the statements. And that's an issue with kind of how do you deal with that? Because it used to be if a politician kind of told a, an untruth, they were caught out and it became this big scandal. You know, like how dare they, which we'll talk about EU referendum, happens a lot. And, you know, it would be a huge gaffe, you know, they'd be kind of followed, they would have to apologize, or they would look um, really stupid. And he just tells so many, so many lies, this conveyor belt of lies, that it's become kind of, well, how, how do you deal with that? And he do, he doesn't, he's not bothered either. He, he will just, you know, sometimes he'll, uh, Trump will admit that he's got it wrong. Um, often he won't, but either way, he just, he just doesn't care, and his supporters, well, some, some of his supporters don't seem to care. And I think the mainstream media and the people against him are really struggling to kind of come back against that. Um, the Guardian, where I work, now runs a series called Lies Told, uh, Lies Trump Told This Week, uh, which is every, every week we do a little column, which was a really, so, such a good idea that the New York Times, I'm gonna say copied it, um, or took inspiration from it. <laughs> um, read the Guardian one, it's better. Um, so that's that, the Huffington Post, um, Ariana Huffington came at the, to speak at the Guardian not that long ago, and they actually, I don't know if anyone's noticed, have a kind of disclaimer at the bottom of any coverage they have at Trump, which is a statement on how kind of, you know, they don't believe in a lot of what he says, um, they don't believe he's qualified for president, and that's a very unusual um, kind of step to take. Obviously, media has editorial lines, um, but that's actually quite, quite something. BuzzFeed, um, you know, huge digital, um, digital only kind of organization, a lot of cut through with millennials in particular. They circulated um, to all their staff, uh, which was then leaked that uh, Trump is a mendacious racist and they wanted to make it clear again in all their coverage they were completely um, against him so there has there has been this this pushback I think from media organizations but the problem is the trust in mainstream media at the moment is so is, is so low um, that a lot of the times you know if the mainstream media says one thing then it plays into this kind of anti-establishment um, feeling that is, is, which I think probably was spoken about in the keynote. Um, it, it's more likely, say, if a media organization says something that people will not believe it or they'll go against that because the you know, establishment is saying it or what's, what's in, in England is a, a big thing about the kind of metropolitan media elite and people are really pushing back against that. So if you had media organizations saying that, no, 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 like, this is not the way it is, um, it kind of ties into Trump's whole thing of being kind of on the side of the people. Um, and there's this really <laughs> weird um, thing where there are certain politicians kind of exploiting this knowledge gap. Um, and I think a lot of the time it is because, because in general people feel alienated by politics, but also I think, which is, which is quite sad, people feel almost like they're not clever enough to engage with it or they feel put off about it because they don't 
um, feel that they understand the issues or can't understand the issues. There is this staggering um, figure or stat around the EU referendum that just before the vote closed, but also after, one of the most Googled questions in the UK was like, what is the ref EU referendum? Uh, like, how does this work? Um, hours before the vote, but also afterwards. So there were so many people Googling afterwards. Um, you know, what, what does the EU referendum mean? Which is, which is really sad. And the problem is, that there are people like Trump ex exploiting that and actually telling so, so many lies um, and the kind of mainstream media outlets that are trying to correct that. There's so little trust there anymore um, that I think people move towards uh, you know, anti-establishment figures, which in many cases are there to, to tell the truth and kind of are actually a massive force for good. Um, but it also means uh, people like Trump have much more cut through, whereas before they wouldn't. And, Again, a lot, a lot of that is really good because it's uh, democratization of information and how we can use social media for like a really good force. Um, but sometimes it can be really damaging and it, it's, it's, so, it's so difficult, I think, and I'll, I'll kind of end on this um, when I get to that slide, but it's really important to keep in mind how information that's shared online can so often not be true and in a way we've kind of lost these gatekeepers. I mean, I had an argument recently, I don't know how people feel about uh, uh, WikiLeaks or Snowden um, and various people, but I kind of always challenge people who talk about someone like Ed Snowden as being a traitor or whatever, or not, or, you know, not looking up for safety. He handed all the information that he had to uh, journalists because he felt that he couldn't make those decisions and he handed it to a bunch of like editors who made those decisions and it was not this kind of like dumping of stuff on the internet. And it really annoys me when people say that he, he leaked all of the stuff because he didn't. He, one of my best friends at The Guardian is a guy called Geo McCaskill who was part of that original team of journalists who went to, to interview him. Um, and in many ways I think we have lost that kind of... Um, sorry. Sorry, is that, is that better? Okay, sorry, sorry. Um, uh, yeah, so, um, oh yeah, and, and the other thing is if you, you notice kind of all the time, and I do a lot of this at work, um, if we find stuff on social media, it's really important to source it and verify it. And a lot of kind of with politics as well, a lot of memes will go around or stats will go around. And sorry if, if nobody could hear me for like the first half an hour. Um, and a lot of people take it as read, and I do think, I mean, the, ti the title of this panel is Ignorance, and I feel it's incumbent upon people to kind of check and know that they can check and verify these sort. I mean, just off the top of my head, um, there are, this is actually a kind of like tragic example, but after the last ter um, terrorist attack in Paris, there was this picture that went absolutely viral of the Eiffel Tower with the lights off. And everyone was like, oh my God, that's such a beautiful tribute. And it was a picture from about two years ago when they had repairs on the Eiffel Tower, so they'd like switch the lights off. But people don't kind of check, they just assume it, they retweet it, um, and you know, it goes on. And that's how kind of misinformation spreads. Um, and there's loads, and on a kind of funny version of that is there's a, there's a picture of um, a guy, uh, a naked guy walking around a festival with this kid kind of positioned, but I'm gonna say like in the genitalia area, just like looking disgusted. And every single like festival, this does the rounds of like being something that happened at that festival. And it did the rounds in Glastonbury this year. And everyone was like, oh, this is amazing from Glastonbury. It was again, like five years ago at a festival. And this has started happening more and more in the realms of politics. People will take something and, and use it to their ends. So the most recent example was, I don't, do anyone, does everyone know who Jeremy Corbyn is? No, yeah, okay. Um, uh, there was, I was just actually in, in Liverpool for the Labour conference there, but a, f um, a kind of a few months ago they had a, a rally in Liverpool and there, it was really, there was a, a big turnout, I think there were like 5,000 people turned up, but this picture went around and they were like, oh my god, look at all these thousands and thousands of people, like he's like a god, um, and the picture was uh, from 2005 at, at, a, at a street parade where I was actually of, um, I don't know if we've got any football fans, uh, but when Liverpool FC win the Champions League, which was great, by the way, I'm a big Liverpool fan, I'm from Liverpool, I was there. But I mean, there was an open top bus in this picture. Three? Three, crap, okay, sorry. Um, and there's a huge bus on this picture with like tens of Liverpool players. 
you know, saying like LFC champion, and people still still spreading it, like Jeremy Corbyn rally, and you just think, no, okay. Um, so I would say, if you have information, if you see information, and your your like friends, please please check. And it's happening with like Facebook; they've taken away um, their kind of editors, their human editors now. Um, I'm not relying on algorithms a lot, and I think that was a bad choice. I think social media. Um, I'm now speeding up, really <laughs> joking. Um, it's really important because I do think they're kind of you know, editorial platforms now, and I think they need to take more responsibility for the content that is on there. A lot of the time they're like, oh no, we're, we're, they define themselves as tech companies, not media companies, um, but I think they need to take more responsibility. And what's interesting about Facebook is that it, it said it, it wanted to move away click from clickbait articles, and it had this thing where it wanted to be taken seriously as a, as a news source, because so many people get their news from, from Facebook. Um, and I can give you two minutes more if you need. Okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> I'm not very good at staying on a on a on a linear line, um, but I'll be I'll be quick. Um, but that that's an issue. I think uh, Facebook and the tech companies really need to, I think, take, maybe you'll speak about this. Take some um, more responsibility. What do we have here? Um, this is back on um, Trump. Very briefly, this is an example of one of his short campaign films again. <laughs> Uh, including, including FBI officials. Look. Well, I don't know why that's funny. Right, so again, this is the kind of thing that Trump and his kind of millennial team are pushing out. Um, that's obviously a really short thing and it cuts through. And <laughs> you can see like some of you laughing now because it does cut through and, and often, you know, I don't know what people think about Clinton, but she sits there and she's quite dry in her presentation and she talks and every, probably like me now, and everyone switches off. Um, and Trump will push these things out and he hits her on Benghazi, he hits her on the, the email stuff. So he, they, they, his campaign are really good at making these short films um, in a way which we did see with Obama in 2008 um, and, and how, how he kind of dealt with that. Um, and because it's the same strategy, but it does have a lot of cut through, especially with um, younger voters. Um, so that is on this. What do we have? We've done this. This is um, Hillary trying to like come back. Um, so you talked about gamification. Um, this is a game that Hillary has called like Trump Yourself. So you can go on its Facebook app. You can go on and basically see all the rubbish things that Trump has said about you. So if you're Muslim or Latino, it's like, oh, what kind of horrible stuff has he said about uh, my community today? Um, but again, this is what you talked about. If you're, you know, there's no price, you are the commodity. This is great, um, but then you are giving Hill to, uh, the Clinton campaign um, access to your Facebook data. So that's true. Like we think this is great. All this technology is free, but the trade-off is that we give them a lot of data. Um, this is very interesting, and I'll try and. This is Trends Map, which is on Twitter. We'll show you the various trends um, that are going on. This is today. You can see in the UK, for some reason, people in the UK are really excited that it's the 1st of October. I don't know why, um, but they're very happy about that. People in London are self obsessed, so that London is trending in London. Um, and the reason I brought this up is because I, I wrote a, a little bit in the, in the article. Um, about whether all of Trump's followers are real. Now, what's interesting if you look at Trump's followers, a lot of them are kind of fake or eggs, as we would call if anyone's on Twitter. Um, and there's a, a, a big, yeah, a big, um, why do I keep doing that? Um, there's a big percentage of Trump's followers that are actually from bot farms. So if you went through the fine tooth comb and looked at these millions of, of Trump followers, you would see that a lot of them are like eggs uh, with, with one follower. And in particular, my colleague Sean Walker did a, a big piece on this and I wrote about it as well. Um, a lot of those that his followers come from areas with, which are kind of renowned for A, bot farms or B, um, social media fraud. So this analysis was done with a lot of his followers and a lot of his likes were coming from Malaysia. Now, obviously, unless they're kind of expats, um, most people in Malaysia don't have a vote in the US election. Um, and the reason I mentioned trends, Matt, is because the hashtag Trump won was trending after the debate of the day with Hillary. And what you can see here, I've just screen grabbed the, the guy who first noticed this, was that that hashtag was originating in Russia. Um, <laughs> so it was not an accurate, again, you have to really like look behind these things, it was not an accurate representation because a lot of 
that the hashtag started from Russia. Um, also, don't follow this guy because his pin tweet is actually really sexist. So, um, haven't even talked about UK, so I'm going to quickly run through that. This is Jeremy Corbyn. He is the leader of uh, leader is the loose word because he can't. He's anyway. Um, he is the leader of the Labour Party, uh, which is the opposition party in the UK. Um, and the reason I mention him is because he has relied heavily on social media. Um, there's a group called Momentum, which are kind of behind him and, and leading his social media. And this was just after he was elected the first time as leader. And I'm just gonna show you this because this is kind of becoming more typical um, than it was. So this is his, the kind of traditional media trying to talk to him right after he was elected. If you would simply answer the question, we would, would stop. Would stop. Hi. There's people bothering me. We're not bothering you. Okay. We're from the press. Hi, Tommy. How are you doing? I'm bringing the car around here. Okay. All right, so this is just an example of um, the leader of a political party not engaging with the media. He's like, you know, I don't, I don't need you, basically, in the same way that Trump is in America. And I mean, Jeremy Corbyn is um, very much on the, on the left. Um, he is kind of... A socialist, he, he wants to take the Labour Party back to its root. Obviously, Trump very much not on the left. So you have these politicians who are polar opposites, but are kind of taking up the same stance. Just for um, reference, you can see Theresa May, who is our Prime Minister um, at the moment, has 164,000 followers on Twitter. Jeremy Corbyn has 639,000 followers on Twitter. For, for context, Cameron had 1.6, but you can see that he's mobilised a lot of like young people online. Again. It, this has to translate to, to kind of in real life voting patterns, but it's just a way of, of, of where this is going. Uh, very, very briefly to end on, EU referendum, which um, unfortunately I obviously voted remain, uh, my side lost. Why do, um, this is a bus that um, the Leave campaign uh, drove around the UK, which says that we send uh, 350 million a week to the EU, let's fund our NHS on that instead. Obviously, after we voted to pull out of the EU, um, Boris Johnson and, and his friends said, oh, no, that's, that figure wasn't correct, um, because actually in rebate money that we get back, it's, it's nothing like that figure. I think it's around 100, 150. Um, and then they denied um, this. This is Ian Duncan Smith um, saying, this picture of him in front of that bus, um, saying that he, he never said that, and that bus wasn't a thing. Uh, and this is the kind of the situation that we're in right now. Um, there were just kind of all these lies being told. But people are so kind of fed up of the establishment and the kind of natural order of things that they sort of turn a blind, a blind eye to this. It becomes this thing where you can have someone blatantly lie. Um, but people kind of just want to change and they're, and they're fed up of it and they don't trust kind of normal sources. And what's sad about that is that the people that they are kind of now trusting more are exploiting that by telling a lot of lies. Um, so yeah, I'll just, just end on that um, and maybe I don't know, bring some more out in the q and I'm sorry if that was scattergun. Thank you. Thank you. So now we continue the discourse with Vlad Yoler. He is the chair of the new media department of the University of Novi Sad in Serbia and also the director of the Share Foundation. Um, the Share Foundation is a non-profit organization that is dedicated to protecting the rights of internet citizens and uh, also is working uh, promoting values of openness, decentralization, free access and exchange of knowledge, information and technology. And at the Share Foundation you always do really great uh, investigation. Actually, we already invited Vladan last April in London when we did the Disruption Network Club there, and you were speaking about the, your investigation of the hacking team. And uh, also at the end of that uh, speech, you were saying that you were working on uh, another investigation on the Facebook algorithm. And uh, so I think this is pretty recent now, just a few weeks that came out. Um, so Vladan will tell us more about uh, what they call the Facebook algorithmic factory. Uh, that is related also the way uh, Facebook uh, is uh, creating an invisible exploitation uh, um, and at the same time also inducing uh, 
I would say, targeting methods also during political campaigns. So I think in that sense, we also reconnect with Hanna and both also with Andrea. So I leave the word to you. I think it's better. Okay. Hello. So I think we are now diving again down into Facebook Aquarium. <laughs> and um, I will start with some data. So there is 1.6 billion active users on Facebook. So this number, it's like bigger than China, for example. So if it's a country, it will be the biggest country in the world. So there is 1 billion login into Facebook every day, 300 petabytes of user data, 1.1 trillion likes since 2004, 4.5 billion likes every day, 3.1 million likes per minute, 17 billion location tagged posts every day, 350 million uploaded photos every day, 4.7 billion items shared each day, and 10 billion messages sent each day. So that's on the one side. On the other side, there is, there is something like 70 billion, okay, a uh, big number, okay? <laughs> $18 billion, I think. It's uh, revenue in 2015. So what we wanted to do, we wanted to create a map or to try to understand how all of those inputs are transformed into this number. Because most of us are using, okay, we are using this service for free. tra la 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 la, -la. So it's also interesting when you are thinking about this revenue that I'm living in Serbia, so it's kind of 3.5 million annual wages in Serbia. So it's one huge factory, you no know? factory big as one country. And if you, each of those people that are using Facebook, they're spending averagely like 20 minutes per day. So that means 300 million free working hours for Facebook each day. 300 million hours. And as we, we heard before, and I'm really proud to be on, on this panel from someone from Ipolita <laughs> because I was like reading a lot of this book and being uh, inspired to, to keep with this uh, investigation. So we often think about ourselves as a, as a workers because we are like thinking that we are important, but as we heard before, we are even not the workers in this case. We are just a raw material for this factory because we will see after the, the work, it's not done by humans, there is no any humans in this factory, the work is done by the algorithm. Not one, but hundreds of different algorithms. So, when, I th when I'm thinking about this, I mostly like like to think about this scene from the, the Matrix, Matrix movie, when there is a batteries. So basically we are resource like this and there are some kind of robots going around our heads and sucking the, the data out of our, our each movement, whatever we do, whatever we like and so on. So we did like different, this is like really hard topic, how to map something that is A, invisible, and something that is inside of the black box. So a lot of academics, acad people from academic uh, community, investigators were trying to do that and uh, our approach was a bit different. What we did, we like spend a lot of hours in, in trying to map all the inputs and to read different policy papers and things like this. But what we really found interesting, it's we found some 7,000 uh, uh, patents that are publicly available online. And it's a lot of text, but we try to read all of those patents and from those patents we were able to understand what's happening inside of this like uh, algorithmic factory. And it looks like this. So, yeah. <laughs> but we will go like step by step. So, First, on the left side of this graph, those are the inputs 
into the factory. In the middle side, you have a storage and algorithms, and on the right side, you have a product. And product is basically how they're targeting us, how they're selling us as a, as a, as a product. So what kind of inputs there are in, in, in this factory? Most of the inputs are coming from our actions and behaviors. It's what we do. And Facebook really like this type of the inputs. So every like, share, search, update state, status, comment, message, link, whatever you do, it becoming a source, it becoming a resource for, for, for Facebook. And there is a lot of ways in which you are interacting with them. Okay. Then the second group of information that you are giving to them, it's something called profile information. And they, they're kind of not so interested in this information because you can lie about yourself. And it's basically what you think about yourself, not what you really are. What you really are for them, it's how you behave. So what you click, what you search, this is what they like. And the third big set of things, it's something that it's called like digital footprint. It's basically how the different kind of data that they are sucking from your devices. Everything that you use that is connected with Facebook, it leaves a lot of traces. And uh, so, for example, through cookies and these pixel technologies, they are able to, I like to think about cookies as a, some kind of mm, octopus, okay? So like around the, the World Wide Web, there is like mind fields of cookies. And we, we did like research and it's like, I think around 50% of the websites that we are visiting have a Facebook cookie. So whenever you go online, you are basically activating those minds that are like saying to them what you do and what, what you like, what you visit. This is, for example, visualization of, of different trackers that they have and how they are uh, embedded in, in website. Google, it's even more evil in, in that way. So it's like 90% of the website have some kind of Google uh, cookies embedded. But it's not, this is just a one part, okay, the third part. The fourth part, it's, it's this that like Facebook have like, they're buying a lot of companies, okay? And most of the time when you hear like they bought like WhatsApp or whatever for like billions and billions of dollars, you should ask yourself why. And the reason it's because it's new set of data for them, new resource for, for, for this factory that they are having. And then they have like a, a partnership with like hundreds and hundreds of different companies, marketing companies that they are like selling and, and doing different things with data. So at the end, they have like huge amount of information about us. So what that's on the one side. On the other side is basically a product. So. And we, what we did, we, we, we found all the, the, the ways how they are targeting people, how they are selling this. So when you want to buy an ad, you can click, I want male, female, whatever, whoever, and they will serve you this person <laughs> or group of people. So we map all of that. And there is kind of interesting thing. You can like buy profiles, okay, select people based on ethnic affinity. You can select them based on different life events, but you can also select them on their like uh, political affiliations. So for example, if you're United States, you can choose people who are likely to engage in politics conservative or likely to engage in politics liberal. So what we really wanted to do, you can also target these different expats or whatever. You, know, you can target people based on, on kind of device they use, a lot of things. So what we wanted is to connect those two things. Because, okay, our first idea was, okay, we will compare the things from the input with things from the output and see are they related. But for some, lot of things we were not able to give an answer. For example, how they know to which political party you are affiliate or whatever, you know, how they know your ethnic affinity. 
do they have, you know, because in inputs you're not giving your ethnic affinity. So that means that they have algorithms or something that is like creating this assumption that you like something. No? So <clears throat> then we start to read all of those uh, patterns, so we found out how the things work. Okay, not so precisely, but so everything that you click, everything that you do, it's collected through something that it's called action logger into action store, okay? And then there is something called content store and there is edge store. And I will explain you now how these things function. So everything, everyone, every photo, every whatever there is on Facebook, it's one node, one node, okay? So every time when you upload a photo, there is a new node. And then those nodes are connected with edges and those edges have a different meanings. So if I upload a photo, relation between me and this photo, it's uploaded. If someone likes the photo, it's relation it's like and so on and so on. By that, they're able to collect, connect, uh, create something that is social graph. That's one network that is connecting all the things on Facebook and all the people or the photos into one big network structure. And then they start to play over that structure with different algorithms that are trying to extract data from, from this network. And there are like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different algorithms, but basically <clears throat> what is like really interesting is that like everything, this, this is all done by the algorithms. There is no any humans, there is nothing. It's all math. It's all statistics, so everything is transformed into some kind of, it, it's some kind of perfect quantification of everything. Huh? But it's not so perfect in a way, it's really fuzzy. They don't think in, in zeros and ones like this guy is Democrat or this guy is Republican, no. They think like this guy is maybe 70% Republican and 30% Democrat. Okay. So it's kind of fuzzy logic. So there are some, is any good cybernetic system, this one have also negative signal, negative responses that are transforming this system. So basically the system is learning from what you do. All the time you are there, you are basically learning this factory to create better profile of you. Every time when you click or don't click something, you're learning them who you are more precisely. And there is like a lot of different, but I will, you can read some of, some parts of, of this research on this uh, website. It's called labs.rs. It's called ShareLab, this place where we publish these kind of things. But there are some, some, some of my favorite algorithms are basically those that are trying to understand you through other people. And this is this surveillance, not direct surveillance on, on you, but other people are also doing surveillance about you. So they're making assumptions, are you, for example, Republican or Democrat, by analyzing people around you as well, how you're connected to them. It's not just about like saying somewhere, I am this political option, no, no. It's maybe on this graph, uh, being a Republican, it's related with Kim Kardashian. Maybe this is relation. If, and if you are close to Kar Kim Kardashian by like, like her, liking her butt or whatever, you, maybe your percentage of, if, of your Republicanness is growing. You know? This is how the, the Facebook is, is, is thinking. And there are different algorithms that are like following you so, for example, there are events that you're like liking or whatever, but they're also taking care, did you really go to the event? Okay, so they are trying to understand, do you lie about things? It's not just what you click and like. So, another, my really favorite one, it's routine estimation. And it's favorite for me because we were before, uh, studying the, the metadata of hacking team and what we were doing, it's trying to understand the patterns of 
behavior. So here we found one uh, patent that is explaining how they are, how Facebook understand where are you, where is your home, what is your job, where is the kindergarten, and how do you travel between those places. So it, they, they are like collecting data about your location and then your patterns of behavior is showing to them what is home, what is job. And then, for example, this information is used for something really stupid to target people. For example, uh, you have, to, if you are buying uh, those ads, you can click on something that it's called like uh, frequent travelers or people who just came from vacation or whatever. All of this is done through those routine estimation and they understand when you, when you change your pattern of, 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 of behavior. So, they really like to understand people to which social class they belong. Because they want to know, are you expensive user or not? Do you buy something or not? To which class you belong? So it's not just about like uh, getting information about your payments, it's also what they do, it's they try to understand in which part of the city you are, you are based, uh, what kind of music do you like. They have a different metrics that is showing to them to which social class you belong. They can associate, for example, camera if you pretend to be someone else, but basically you are using the same camera, they know, ah, oh, okay, this person is pretending to be someone else, but he is basically this other per person because it's the same mobile phone with the same camera that have the same metadata about something. So, a lot of crazy things there in this, in this like, uh, patent. So, what, what, what's the point? Why, why we were spending our time in doing this? Me personally, I really like to, 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 to explore unknown things. And this is one like really unknown thing. And it's a dark box that should be uh, explored. Other side, so probably this map, it's maybe not the most precise map, that, but it is a map. It exists before it didn't exist. So now we have some kind of map. And the uh, second thing I really like to think about that as some kind of, you know, like uh, ancient cartographers. Did you ever saw like a map from, I don't know, ancient times? It doesn't really look like now. So in the same thing, in the same way, this map is probably not so precise, but, but is something. This, this map just represent one process, how our behavior and transform into the profit. Another part of the process that is basically probably more interesting for this panel is how this is related with the news feed. And basically it's the similar inputs, it's the similar storing information. It's another algorithms that play with, with this data. And for me what is like really, really scary, it's that like you know, based on what we do, based on how we behave, based on what we like or whatever, it's what we are going to get. So we are closing ourselves, and there is this theory of uh, filter bubble or whatever, but we are closing in ourselves in, 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 in some bubble of, of information that Facebook think that we want to see in order to click on something and to buy something, you know? And how the, the impact of this mediator between us, it's huge, you know, like this story of like, if you have a, I don't know, terrorist attack, the, they can really easily change few parameters and you will have more happy pictures of cats or whatever and less blood. 
and impact of these kind of things are, uh, can be like really huge for 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 how you behave, what you do, and and so on. I'm more or less done. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot to all of you. I uh, just want to make a small comment and then I want to open to the people because I think we are a bit late. I mean, I found really fascinating the discourse of the technology enabling the truth because in a sense you really believe that the technology is the truth but then what you just say actually is demonstrating that the technology is also a matter of interpretation and so also the algorithm of Facebook that is also striving to uh, find a sort of truth that is made by people that uh, make a process that is pretty speculative. So in a sense this also demonstrates, I think, that the technology doesn't always tell the truth because it becomes really a matter of what we understand and what we interpret of that. And then we have a politician that instead tell a lot of lies <laughs> and so they apply what we call the post-truth by detail, the lies being enabled by media that are trying to find the truth. So this is also pretty, I think, interesting because, I mean, the lies of Trump are spread through Facebook uh, as the truth, if you want, but they are still lying. So I think this is really what I was reflecting about. And um, in a sense, I also think that uh, this demonstrates that there is a lot of challenge about uh, how the truth is created and uh, how power is enabled, and also what is the role of technology into all this process, and especially of social media. So I don't know if you want to comment on that, and then we can open to the public. Um, do, you, do you mean about the power of tech companies and the power uh, you, you talk about the power of tech companies? Yeah. Okay. Um, I think that it is uh, quite, quite worrying um, how complacent people are um, in not recognizing the power of, of tech companies and the influence they have on our lives. Um, both of these guys have talked about that and, you know, specifically with the algorithms and I think I think you kind of touched briefly on the idea of echo chamber and people don't realize that sometimes it's kind of quite um, complacent. People will either think, oh, everyone, ag everyone agrees with me. Um, but that's because certain algorithms are based, like Twitter, for instance, the, the trending hashtags that you see and a lot of people don't realize is this is, is based on your location and also the other people that you follow. So maybe you, you think that everybody is in agreement with you and there's, there's, there's no kind of rising, um, you know, potential of, of uh, a vote no in the EU referendum because you go online and you see that everybody else thinks the same thing as you and you don't realize that either the people are offline or do, who don't engage um, think something completely different. And I think people in the media and people, especially young people who are online, if you, if you do polling, online polling is always different from telephone polling because of the demographics online. Um, and I think people kind of need to take, um, kind of look more as well at the offline rather than thinking that everything online is, is, is the truth and also, as you mentioned, Vlad, and the ability to lie. I mean, even as youngsters, when people go on Facebook and you have to be 13, you, you just click a button, you know, not, they don't know and you can lie lots and people will post an Instagram photo that they've lifted from Google Images, they weren't there. Um, so yeah, that's just briefly. So is, um it is, uh, um, it depends. I mean, is uh, truth is uh, a correspondence between uh, words and uh, the world, words and things, or not? Or truth is negotia negotiated? I think in our point, from our point of view, truth is a negotiation about something, uh, is a narrative. You can make a genealogy about truth, about what do you think is truth. Of course, reality exists, but it doesn't mean that uh, truth about people uh, are data uh, extracted from people. 
is, a, is problematic, this is essentialist assumption, I think. And um, the, the word truth in Greek is aletheia. It means togliere il velo, unveil, unveil. But the unveiling stuff uh, means that is a path. It's not a, it's a, a discourse. It's something you you are doing. It's not something you can reach, and it's not something that is inside you or even outside you. It's just something you can do with other people, and it's not. Uh, it's a question of perception. Of uh, I don't know. It's it's a story also, and. Uh, is the, the, the point is, I think this kind of technology uh, are essentialist. Wants that we have an, es an um, essential uh, consistency inside us. And the point, I, I do not think that Trump's lies. I mean, the character of Trump, uh, do not lie, is hyper consistent with himself. The character is completely clear in the sense of I mean, what does it mean, truth? Uh, I don't know. It's too difficult to go. That's okay. Yeah. I don't know. F for me, it's like really interesting. This. Uh, so, really like to think about Facebook as a supermarket, as a huge mall, and then all of this idea of having like a democracy or truth or whatever in shopping mall or like uh, investigative journalism in, as a part of the shopping mall, that's kind of crazy. And basically what is really for me like, like the, the most deepest uh, problem there, it's, it's this that you're like, um, that you are becoming some form of, uh, you, you are some kind of nano discourse for, for them. So it's, it's so precise that they are trying to build a little reality for you. And then there is no one truth, there is like one million nano truth for each user of Facebook. There is a little truth, little universe that he is living in and where he feels happy to buy something. So, I don't know, does this answer to? I would say let's open now to the public if there is any question. Yes, over there. Uh, yes, hi, thank you very much uh, to all of you. Um, I was just thinking of something like all this discussion about truth and um, profiling, I mean, you profiling on Facebook, for example, and can't remember who said it, but how um, this kind of distrust, uh, you can lie about your profile, right? I mean, how, oh yeah, you said how like Facebook didn't necessarily trust profiles, that was not such interesting information because you can actually lie about who you are, what you did, uh, your diplomas, etc. And, um, and this idea of how, like, I, I was listening to something on the radio the other day, how um, uh, uh, in human resources to kind of recruit people more, more and more, they actually trust more what you do, you know, how who you are is not anymore what you claim you are in a CV, for example, or on your profile, but who you are is um, a, a accountable t according to what you do, who you associate to, um, you know, exactly what you said about Facebook, all those kind of uh, analysis. And I would like you to kind of react to this, because, I mean, in a way, you could say to what extent is it valid or not, because as you said, I mean, what, what is truth? I mean, maybe you lie about yourself all the time, and should we trust more or less what Facebook says? Of course, I'm, I'm a bit of the devil's advocate here, but... I mean, it's kind of interesting. I felt it's kind of interesting, this idea of who you are and how you lie and what should you trust and how you even using it on, you know, on the kind of job market. Just, just, uh, just imagine the president in 2050 who is born with the Facebook. You know, it's, it will be really hard to, to construct next president because you, you cannot let him be on Facebook and behave as a human do on Facebook because then he will have a history. And this is not the same as the people who are now like presidents or in power. They don't have web history behind them. Okay, it's not so deep. So this pressure of 
Facebook being there and being used as a tool for, for uh, when you are applying for a job, that you are analyzed by your behavior, personal behavior. This is a huge element of control. Other questions? Yes. Um, thank you for your presentations. I just wanted to ask um, if you know any ways to kind of um, break the algorithm, like uh, maybe algorithm of the Facebook, maybe feeding it with spam to um, fill it with misinformation to disrupt this um, collecting information, because um, maybe I'm wrong, but uh, on Facebook, it also calculates the amount of time uh, you sp we spend on a link or on an image. Like, it, you don't have to click on something. It tracks your uh, cursor movements. So, like, is there anything that disrupts this? Mm, but Facebook changes. This is the problem. I mean, is a cybernetic system, so it is not fixed and you can hack the system one time, but the next time the system will integrate your hack. And this is the main problem with this kind of technologies. I mean, we do not have, I think, to hack Facebook because hacking is, uh, is a problem. You are feeding uh, their algorithms. We hacked Facebook uh, when we wrote the book uh, in 2010 for two years with the bots, you know, piece of codes and uh, acting like humans, but basically they do not work right now because they change it, the, the interfaces and, st and codes, so they learn from us, you know, even if you don't want. So, in my opinion, no, it's not possible. It's like you don't have to do, to use it. And that's all. But it's my opinion, huh? it's our opinion. Then, if, you, if your goal uh, go in the same direction of Facebook, which is total disclosure, total transparency, radical transparency of everything, yes, you can use it. And it works. Really, it works. It works very good. And better and better. If you do not want radical transparency, total transparency, try to avoid to use it and try to avoid the people around you use it. Because the point is not people are scared about, you know, big governments and stuff like that. Well, but the problem are your friends posting your, your, <laughs> your, you know, you on Facebook. This is the problem are people around you. For us, the problem are there, La Sartre was right. Well, okay, let's stop, <laughs> stop Rhea, sorry. Can I? Sorry, yeah, good. Sorry, I, because you were asking for um, how you could hack Facebook and I, uh, a few weeks ago I saw this performance of this group and um, they were suggesting uh, or they were saying that the, um, uh, the value of Facebook is that you have one uh, profile and you have one person, so you have one identity and they were saying, well, just don't use it as a singular person, one profile, just, you know, open it up and spread your password and um, just use it as a, you know, like five people can use one profile or ten people can use it one profile. So then it kind of gets distracted because, you know, I don't know, it's just not one person, so that's... I find it very interesting because you still can get you still can get the information. You don't have to keep away from everything. You don't need to become this eremite sitting in a closed box. You still can get the information, but not as a singular person. Yeah. On on that point, is this can everyone hear me? Um, there's obviously uh, sock puppet accounts where one people you know one person will create like multiple accounts either kind of manually or more often not manually. I got like really badly uh, kind of trolled for about six months by, uh, it turned out it was this 22 year old in Miami, but he um, was basically buying uh, Twitter followers to kind of spam me. So I would sit there and I'd be in a bar and just watching them go up and up and up. 
and this went on for a few months and uh, Twitter had to kind of zap them um, because it was just these kind of, you know, multiple kind of bot followers. Um, and obviously everybody is not kind of who they are all, all the time and catfishing and all of, all of this is, is, you know, become part of that narrative. The other thing about manipulation is obviously that's really easy to do um, with people or even kind of um, things like page views. There's a, every, every kind of post that the Guardian article does on Russia, there will always be what looks like thousands and thousands of comments and um, it comes from like Russian bot farms a lot of the time. So they're kind of automated spam comments essentially. Or actually there is now this weird burgeoning industry of people who are kind of paid minimum wage actually to sit and spend a lot of time um, writing these kind of comments. So that's interesting. And the other thing um, in terms of what people read and what they share, um, the kind of analytics of the Guardian website, which you can kind of go on if you work there, and a lot of people don't, but I'm fascinated by it. Um, it will show, you know, the time that people spend on it. And according to the kind of referrer, it changes every social platform. You can see how long people spend on it. Something like Reddit, for instance, is always, it's like 10 seconds, because people click and then they click out again. And the bounce rate is what we call it. Um, that's really fascinating to see the articles that people are spending longest reading and the ones that they aren't. And what's also really interesting is um, there's something called virtue signaling. Everyone wants to kind of present the best version of themselves online, um, as we've said. And there's this fascinating thing when um, Nelson Mandela died, the shares that we could see from all those pieces that we did was not corresponding to the people reading it. So people were sharing it and they weren't reading it, but they wanted to kind of look good and be like, oh, you know, this is so sad. Um, and that is quite often something that we see with articles or they, you know, people shared like a 15,000 uh, word long read, like this is fascinating, you have to read it, they haven't read it. Or we'll see that they've read like the first two parts and then the paragraphs and then they've clicked off, but they will share it and say that it's, it's fascinating. So again, it's about kind of un, untruths. And again, you say truths are, is, is obviously not always objective, my truth can be different from yours, um, but that's why people get confusing newspapers because they'll moan about something and not realize that it's in the opinion section, not the news section. But with the Trump thing, I'm talking about like actual facts, like, you know, Obama was born in America, things that are kind of uh, quantifiable and that we can check out as it were. Thanks. Um, other questions? Yeah, one at the end over there. Hi, um, do you think maybe the negative coverage of Trump um, is actually giving him further exposure and therefore aiding his campaign? Um, yeah, I think that's a very good point. Uh, I think he has been given a lot of free press off the back of it. Um, and because people, again, it's as I say, all of, all of these mentions and all the engagement it gets. It's, I mean, there's obviously that old thing of no publicity is bad publicity. And I think until now, and um, he has been given a, a, free, a free ride, um, I don't think, like people have not gone hard enough on the fact that he hasn't released any of his, his tax information. And it's almost, it, it became a joke, it started as a joke. It was like, you know, ha ha, Trump's running for president. Um, then he got the nomination and I think for a long time he was getting so much press, um, uh, you know, just around kind of how funny that was, that he became kind of center and mainstream. And as you say, it's kind of if you ignore something, but because he wasn't being ignored, um, I agree. I agree that he's been given a lot of um, publicity and to a certain extent that aids it. And, and similarly, um, with the referendum in the UK, a lot of it was based on the personalities. It was Boris Johnson, it was Liam Fox. Um, it was kind of David Davies, and everyone was so kind of uh, taken up with like making jokes about how ridiculous the Tory party were and the infighting that it distracted from a lot of the more serious things. But it, it keeps them in the news all the time and it can, I think, yeah, um, be negative sometimes. And obviously, again, if people take um, sort of a kind of snobby attitude, I think it alienates people even more um, because it can come across as, you know, people um, or the media don't like Trump just because he's he's different and he's anti-establishment and he's not one of us. And I think that taking that kind of tone sometimes rather than engaging with why, you know, working class voters or certain people in certain states kind of 
you know, the ones that aren't massively racist, um, but are, are kind of just attracted to someone who's not part of the usual order. Um, I think the media could do a better job, actually, uh, of really sticking to, you know, a kind of good line of attack rather than just kind of treating it as a joke, because it's not that funny anymore. Thank you. Thanks. There was another question there. Yeah. What uses of Google and Facebook data by client, their clients would people find especially troubling, offensive, or evil that we're, we're not, that we wouldn't even think of? Um, yeah, I, I'm trying to, to, I have the same, like, mm, uh, asking myself the same, same question really often, and um, I think most of the things that are happening under the hood in Facebook is more, more or less uh, illegal by a lot of different regulations in Europe, okay, the way how they process data, the way the questions that they ask data, because basically what you should have, like you should inform people whenever you are like analyzing data in some specific way, so people should know that you are using data for this. What they are doing is like completely like doing whatever they want and making different kinds of uh, uh, questions to this data that they are, they are collecting. Uh, for me, like this uh, racial profiling, one set of data that is like really, really uh, non-ethical. Uh, then we have, uh, uh, I think also profiling people based on, on their social classes, it's also like not so, uh, Okay, I think in in general, whatever they do, it's 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 not so okay. <laughs> so, what will be the worst combination of data? I don't know. I think they are more. It's more a question for them because they are like studying this. <laughs> like, so I don't know. Thing to, to add if possible, uh, we we wrote a book about Google uh, ten ten years ago well before the um, stuff about um, filter bubble, analyzing algorithms, and basically the point is that they are using the profiling stuff, and profiling is criminal stuff. You know, Lombroso is about revealing you from how, you, how it, your body is. As anarchists and criminals are like this and this and this is the same thing is go inside you and we will see in your behavior and the behavior of other people we will predict you and this is the, the whole point to us is even not a problem of data is a problem of prediction because machine and the algorithms and people behind this is the, the point they they want to be condescendent with you they patronize you. If you ask to those algorithms, these are, but what is the reality? They, they, they give you what they think you want. What do you, there is no place for conflict. No place for conflict. If there is no conflict, nothing can happen. Nothing good can happen to us. Okay. Yeah, this is this question of this. Uh predictive policing and all of this idea that, that by spotting the anomaly in your behavior, you are able to predict that this person is, I don't know, criminal or not criminal or whatever, and based on that you are, uh, it's, uh, what was the name of the movie? Minority Report idea. Okay, that's one, uh, f for me, I'm like in, in, in last few months really into, into investigating different forms of different objects related to this Internet of Things concept, and that's, that's even more scary for me, because it's like really entering into your home, and uh, uh, 
it can really in a way feel you. This on Facebook, it's more like you really need to do something. In your home, you are there. And then trying to understand like how you behavior at your home, what is your pattern of behavior, when you are sick, when you behave different, is there like two or five people at your home, is your fridge is opening and closing more often today than yesterday, are you depressed? You know. So this is for me like uh, uh, some kind of right, scary scenario. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is a question over there. It's, oh. it's, um, it's like, uh, just sorry, sorry, very briefly, yeah. it's just, as well, companies only need like a tiny, tiny bit of data to extrapolate so much about you. Um, like you say, metadata, people, I mean, I remember when um, Snowden Revelations came out, we, Theresa May, who's the Prime Minister at the moment, uh, really pushed through this thing called Snoopers Charter in the UK um, about dragging in information. And so many people are kind of like, well, it doesn't matter because they don't get the content of our phone calls, they don't know, and people get confused between data and metadata. But just the data, just the metadata, sorry, can tell you so much and people don't realize that you can learn so much about like, oh, well, you know, I called Andrea at this time, our conversation lasted this many minutes, and you know, or I was here at this point and that point in time and you just put the pieces together and it tells you so much about a person. So I suppose don't be lulled into, not to scare manga, but don't be lulled into this false sense of security that just because people don't have access to the actual data, they can't tell things about you because they really can. Just that. Yeah, this was also the investigation of the hacking team, actually they did, all about metadata. But now <laughs> there is a question there. Hello, test, one, two. One, two, one, two, thanks. Okay, I uh, really loved your presentations and uh, all of this investigation and these uh, black boxes and everything. So, um, leaves me with this ominous f feeling of the, these dark powers that are <laughs> out to get me, which brings me back to the previous presentation. And, uh, and then wanting to see like what, uh, like to really play devil's advocate, also because I'm feeling like just sinking through my seat with uh, depression after this and not really able to act in any way. Uh, so, do you, what, is, uh, what is any actual evidence that this huge, horrible machine is actually doing anything? Like that it's actually influencing, like, so there are the, the, this, this uh, fear, I think like you're asking, qu posing questions, if, if I can like draw an unfair comparison to Trump, you know, just to mess with you. But like, yeah, asking questions and you know, the, seeing these um, ominous, uh, of course, this money-making machine, you know, and, and we don't know how it works and whatever. Uh, but do we know that it's, on, on the one hand then, it's trying to, it, it's their, trying to steer me towards a certain behavior. Do we know that, that what the, the behavior that it's influencing actually has any major implication on my life? Or is it about my clicking behavior? And it's all a bunch of, it's my 20 minutes of day that I have lost. Uh, then there's the, like, it's selling me as a product. Is it actually any good at it? Advertisers, of course, need to spend their money somewhere. That's where they're spending their money now. Maybe it's all a, a con on advertisers. Like maybe Facebook is just the, like right now they're dominating the market, but maybe they are the worst advertising company in the world. They just, they put the others out of business because they offer things for free. Uh, but maybe they're not at all as good at selling products as whatever newspapers were or whatever. Uh, and then, like the, the, the use for actually targeting for really malign or misusing all of this tracking for malign purposes of targeting me or like the, 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 the president who grew up with Facebook. Is, is it, might it not be that this is the, the, the most inefficient way of actually tracking and, uh, and putting a, a person under pressure when you can do this with a team of private investigators of whatever, 20 people for a week and you have everything you need to destroy a person, whether they were ever on Facebook or not. Uh, I was really thinking during the first panel, like, am I, am I like a conspiracy theorist? Me too. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, uh, okay. 
mean, I'm not, I'm not questioning, like the, the you, I see like all of this stuff, but so the, the main question is, what is the actual potential of it? Uh, okay. to actually reach out and uh, no. crush people, if that is what so it's doing, because that's the, the feeling you get. Here. Yeah, so there is this guy, is it Mark or whoever, you know, it's a guy. And maybe today he's not, he's just want to, in his autistic world, he want to earn money and be social, you know, or whatever. It's him, okay. But he earn, or they, Whoever, like, they earn like billions and millions and billions of, of dollars in really short period. Okay, so they will become a new bourgeoisie, new form of power, economical power. Those guys, and they are already that, and they will have kids. You know, prince, prince of Facebook. You know, and maybe, <laughs> maybe today they are not crazy. But maybe their kids are going to be like really great. You know, you never know. Uh, so it's our, we should just ask questions no? and try to investigate what is inside. Because maybe this will help us in the future even. Yeah, m people who are coming from like media theory and this kind of, they n know how to be on the edge of like conspiracy theory and to dramatize things. And like, I also like to do that. But, I think it's really important that we practice this, to, to practice like opening and cracking of black boxes if we can to, to, to do this. I think they, they still didn't reach potential of like uh, using what they can do in, in like an evil, completely evil way, like to destroy humanity or whatever. They are still occupied with the idea of getting money. And this is like really sad because like, the toppest minds in, in, in like uh, statistical analysis, data analysis, whatever, are creating a really beautiful mathematical functions just to sell ads. Uh, so for me, this is like really sad. Yeah. I don't know. I have a, ju just a, a point is when, when we make uh, training and workshop with, chi with children is, is evident, the point. The point is that they cannot be alone. When they are alone, they, they take their devices and try to connect to someone else. This is a problem. This is a major disruption of how society works. Because if you do not enjoy yourself, be with yourself, you know, you have to be with yourself with, for all your life. This is a big problem if you do, do not, if you cannot stay with yourself alone for two minutes, this is a problem to me. Because your experience has to be mediated by someone else, which is the prince of Facebook, what, you know. And they have social problems. I mean, we know this kind of people. They are geek suprematists, nerd suprematists. They're suprematists. They, they, they think really they are making the world a better place, you know. And who asks them? I don't ask them to make the world a better place. I don't know. This is the point to me. Okay, I think, I don't know, Anna, you want to comment further? Or we close it here? You want to? Yeah. Um, I just uh, think that. <sighs> Um, on a lighter note, I'm sure there is some altruism there. I do think it's great that everybody um, is better connected. And, uh, the technology is fantastic, but I agree. Um, I think it's actually having a really big impact on mental health and young people's mental health, um, which I kind of get chastised for saying that because people say, oh, well, you know, every time there was technolo technolo technological invention, people said, oh, you know, it's so scary and, you know, blah, blah, blah. But uh, it does worry me that you see kids kind of hyper-connected all the time. Um, as for kind of making the world a better place and stuff, it is, it's always kind of an end goal of, you know, like India. Um, Facebook put a lot of money in India and kind of connecting everyone and really wanted, they had a huge project. And it's great because you think, wow, there's, you know, really low level uh, network in India. But at the end of the day, it's kind of 
to create another market of, of millions of people to earn them more money and glean more data. And it was, it was sort of like a conditioning because people kind of got hooked on Facebook for a while. They could only get to that landing page. So they were like, oh, we're going to give everyone access to the internet in, uh, in India. But uh, for, for a while, it was like just Facebook. So Facebook it was, is the internet to Facebook. Um, so we really need to kind of yeah, keep asking questions and keep kind of pushing forth on that. But there are, are lots of good things about social media but, and the internet in general, obviously. But it, it's, it's fun. I like a meme. I love a meme or two. But I, I think people are, you know, the dopamine hits that people get from notifications and things, it does sometimes, I think, tend to push people to post more and more extreme things just because, you know, they, they want more interaction. And I suppose that's just again, like the vanity of the human race, but let's just end on that, on that on positive note for me anyway. So I would like just to, as usual, also announce what would be the topic of the next Disruption Network Lab, but first I would like to thank a lot Vlada, Hannah and Andrea for this great discussion. Thanks a lot. So, I think that we introduced it pretty well. <laughs> uh, our next conference will be November 25th and 26th, and we will speak about the discourse of truth telling, especially the title will be Truth Tellers. And uh, from one side, uh, um, we will discuss about whistleblowing again, that is a thread that we have been also developing a lot at the Disruption Network Club in the, I would say, last uh, months. Uh, and also years, because last year we also spoke a lot about whistleblowing, uh, questioning also what uh, whistleblowing could be uh, considered, like after now, I would say, two years uh, from, uh, you know, the Snowden revelation. So uh, I think it will be a lot about also uh, speaking about the truth and also what actually the truth means, and at the same time also questioning the truth itself because uh, in a sense what we know that what is truth for me is not truth for you or for another person and at the same time uh, i think it's also important to uh, give a critical prospecting uh, both on uh, the result of many leaking process that we had and also value them but also bring the discourse of the truth uh, in a critical perspective uh, leading also on the artistic experimentation that could uh, uh, come out of that. So, because we also know that the history of uh, net art, for example, was uh, working a lot with fakes and plagiarism and a lot of uh, playful experiments exactly on the truths uh, that you could uh, create online and offline. And I think also, you know, this is a development uh, that's... Uh, should be still really reflected about. So I think also a lot of discourse in the past really uh, gave a lot of power to the truth itself and also truth telling. But I think it's also good always to consider truth as a questionable concept and what actually it means. So I can just announce uh, briefly, for example, two people that are already confirmed are Gabriella Coleman and also again Mustafa Al Bassam that was with with us last year from the LALSEC collective and he will be the keynote this time really telling us a lot about uh, Anonymous and LALSEC uh, that I think was really great experiment about the truth you know and um, then we will have uh, uh, our pre-event as usual and this will be November 9th at Spectrum and so I will work together with Gabriel Moses that is sitting over there <laughs> and we will discuss a lot about uh, also the discourse of, um, you know, the truths uh, online and offline uh, and also uh, having uh, uh, a discussion on the speculative aspects uh, of truths in the on online realm that I think uh, Gabriel is really great on that. <laughs> and um, so that uh, is uh, more or less what will happen. And uh, I would like to conclude also, as usual, giving the great thanks uh, to all the team. So I would like to invite also here on stage Daniela Silvestrin, that has been really important in the conceptualization of this event. Applause 
so you are tired now. <laughs> and so maybe we can stay all year, otherwise we give the shoulder to our panelists. Um, and so, so together we can also thanks the rest of our team, of course, Kim Foss and Claudia Dorfmuller, uh, Tabea Hampers, Jonah Franke, the Rofso Film uh, crew, uh, Elisabeth Henkel, Maria Silvano, Gabriel and Antonia Eichenauer. So with that we finish. <laughs> <Yoo -hoo. laughs> and uh, thank you again for being with us, all the panelists uh, and the public until now. Now we have to you know, drive into the rain in Berlin uh, and see you in November. Thank you. <laughs>